You're tuning in the program called What's Going On on FlintTalkRadio.com. I'm George Moss, the host of the program that comes on every Monday from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And every second and fourth Mondays of each month, we will bring you at 3.30 Satoru's Black History Corner. And that program goes on for about 30 minutes uh, after we finish up here. It comes on at 3.30 and stays around until around 4.00. And I want you to stay tuned today to that program, which I run home to watch live. And uh, that's kind of um, a hazardous course to do in these conditions because the potholes, which I really think we should be calling ditches, <laughs> along the way back and forth. <laughs> and I'm driving my, my big car today to the studio. <clears throat> and that means I've got to uh, be extra careful because that car costs a lot of money. <laughs> More than a small car that I also drive when I'm going around the city. But every once in a while, that, that car ends up in the front. I have to drive the ones in the back of the, in the driveway. And today, that was my uh, quote-unquote uh, Lincoln, which I bought as a uh, retirement present to myself. Since my staff didn't give me any, anything to go away with, except I did, I did get a watch, a uh, gold watch. <clears throat> which is like I think that's pretty well standard after you spend about thirty years in the workforce. <laughs> I think that I think those prizes, by the way, or get out of here prizes rather than than uh, retirement gifts. I think it's kind of like saying you know get out of here and what what did you stay around so long for? <clears throat> but anyway, it's appreciated and I decided to up the ante a little bit on my own part and I bought myself a car. I was I was owned when I was working. And that was 39 years in the uh, public school system and some other years I was working on a part-time basis uh, in various universities. <clears throat> and I was, uh, uh, dec I decided that when I retire finally, after um, almost 40 years in the public school, three of which was in the principal's office, <clears throat> I would um, uh, do something I had not done over the course of my working career and that was to buy myself a big car uh, having uh, been a pen and pitcher all my life and <clears throat> saving the little nickels and dimes here in quarters there, I decided I would uh, get my first big car. And I, I had small cars, a medium-sized car. I'm going to get me a, a large car. So I went and bought myself a 2005 uh, Lincoln. <clears throat> and you can believe that's the last car I'm buying. <laughs> so I got to take care of it. And when I leave here after this program is over, I'll have to uh, be very careful driving back through the community and going through uh, these potholes, which is going to be a post I'll be doing tomorrow as I continue what I started today, which is part one of a two-part series on uh, my uh, ex expose of uh, of the government and these politicians, because I want to do some things that will bring out further understandings of what we're actually dealing with in this country, so we can begin to hollow out, and when I say hollow out, I'm not saying holler, I'm hollow out uh, those um, reads that make it appear that we uh, can't see through the little, you know, the reads have a thing. If you read it, if you root it out, you can see through it. <laughs> I want to uh, root out uh, the reads toward uh, Washington so we can see clearly. We can do what Johnny uh, Nash said, <clears throat> who said he can see clearly now because the rain is, uh, the rain is, is uh, stopped. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> I want to have bring about some uh, clarity in what we are looking at, and we don't even see what we're looking at in Washington. And I'll tell you something. Jim was saying this before I came into the studio, before I came into the uh, uh, recording part of the studio, that a lot of people are picking up on my on my post, and uh, that's not all. That's not all good. <clears throat> some of them are picking up on my post to criticize <laughs> what I'm writing, and uh, and I'll talk about some of that before we get off the air today. And try to bring some clarity into into that conversation because I did a post last week on <clears throat> Al Sharpton, uh, who was uh, out there was usual nonsense, and of course that that stirred up the the hornet's nest. You know, I, it just dawned on me that it's like you know conservatives will tell you you know people to depend on their own uh, their own abilities, try to develop their own abilities, mm -hmm. and I don't see where that's such a mean spirited thing. Unless you're totally aware that this person you're addressing, these people you're addressing, don't have these capabilities. Whereas the liberals, the progressives in this country, we're calling the progressives, mm -hmm. want everybody else to give over their freedom to an elite crew, <laughs> a group, 
Yeah, they're the liberators. <laughs> they're seeing themselves as liberators. Yes. I mean, and I don't, I don't understand. I mean, I don't understand how we can be <laughs> we conservatives or we, we libertarians considered. We're saying, you know, I think you can do this. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you can do this. I was for really mean spirited. I think the liberals are far more insulting than the uh, person who is a, more of a conservative person. Uh, they're, totally, they're totally insulting because they want you to suspend your own uh, thinking and adopt their predetermined and, of course, their uh, heavenly um, uh, inspired uh, uh, view of society, which only they know best. And we're supposed to be in lockstep lock with that point of view. And if we are not, <clears throat> then we're wrong automatically because of our disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in other words, they're asking us to give up our own liberty <clears throat> to, do our own, to do our own thinking and to adopt instead groupthink, which is where all of them are on the left. Uh, you know, you can, it, that's why when I see, the, see them on, on television, if I see one person discussing something and they bring another liberal behind them to discuss the same point, I know I'm going to hear the same thing. They're not going to have a lot of, of disagreement between what one is saying and what another is saying. And they can't even see that they're, 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 they're nothing but parents. And I um, uh, will stand where I'm standing and would do so resolutely without apology. And they can't get that through their thick skulls that I'm not one of the ones they can come on my post. <laughs> And push me off what I what what it is I'm saying. In fact, uh, in fact, I just I just I came to the studio about uh, two minutes late <clears throat> because I was finishing up a post on on Facebook, which I had promised to do based upon what I had written. Uh, 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 what was it yesterday? <clears throat> where I got a lot of I think I had 24 people that were reposting what I had written, <clears throat> and uh, it had to do with um, some of the marquee things I write about on Facebook. <clears throat> where I'm taking to task some of these um, these liberals who uh, think that they're going to come on my post and get me to stand down. Now, in fact, what it does, quite frankly, it energizes me, and it also makes me more careful because I'm determined not to go on the on the wall and just start spouting off, uh, you know, uh, n um, nonsense. <clears throat> because I know the people are going to be watching what I write in order to come on there and then try to nail. Any boys I left loose, I nail those boys back down. So I have to be very careful in what I write, and even in my spelling, because they've gotten so uh, desperate right now to criticize what I write that they want to look at any misspelled word, even when they know it's a typo, <laughs> and they want to criticize the writing. I'm not hearing you, John. Something has been turned off. Uh, yeah, so Obama only had one word to spell the other day, and he did that. So <laughs> I saw that. I mean, this this guy. I mean, this guy didn't even go to class. I mean, I, I, there's no there's no reason to believe that while this man was smoking that pot and and by his own admission, that's in his books that he was uh, doing that while in the university. You can't go into these university classrooms and um, uh, uh, be that far removed from where they are. These these universities have these large classrooms. These places are like auditoriums, and you cannot be in a in a fog where your mind is uh, inebriated with either uh, some kind of alcohol or you are intoxicated by some kind of um, uh, other uh, hard drug, some drugs even harder than, than that, and then be trying to go through the maze and find out, first of all, who's standing up there, where is he standing, and then beyond that, what is he saying? You can't be in an in inebriated state. And this president's latest faux pas, which that's, which one is the latest? They all uh, are mistakes. Nothing that comes out of this man's mouth has anything to do with any reality, and which I'll be talking about that too before we get off the air. <laughs> but the, 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 this man was um, uh, referring to Aretha Franklin, you know, the queen of soul. I mean, I have to take Ray Charles' word for it on that one. Uh, Ray, uh, Aretha is, a, is the one. I mean, I liked I liked uh, Whitney Houston too, and I I liked some of uh, some of the other singers, but when it comes down to uh, if you want to call somebody a soul sister number one to balance out James Brown, <clears throat> and that's got to be Aretha Franklin. I think everybody knows that one of her marquee songs is uh, she wanted some respect, which she took from Otis Redding, by the way, who sang it first, and then people forgot who was the author of the song, and then here's Aretha Franklin up there taking all the bows for it, just just. <laughs> Just like it was done in terms of uh, Glass Night and the Pips. Now, I didn't say Pimps. Uh, Glass Night and the Pips, 
where they put out the song, I heard it through the grapevine. <laughs> and they did the song originally. And then Marvin Gaye got a hold to it and it slowed the beat down. Rather than a, than a two count, I heard it through the grapevine. He said, he slowed it down a, a beat and sang it through the grapevine. Everybody thought that Marvin Gaye, because they didn't pay attention to Glass Night and the Pips, because so, that was too fast. <laughs> and when they caught it with, the, with, with Marvin Gaye, who slowed the, the beat down and, you know, synthesized non rhythm is what he really was doing. I mean, I, I tried to dance on that song. I heard it through the grapevine. How much long? Try to do a dance on that, and and the faster. But anyway, you know, I'm. <laughs> anyway, when uh when, when when he put the song out, they forgot all about Glass Night and the Pips, and all of a sudden, uh, Marvin Gaye was the originator of the song. I mean, I I knew they were twelve shades mad, and I don't know how mad Aretha Franklin should have been. The man's up there talking about Aretha Franklin wants to talk about respect. Now, now look look, uh, folks. Here's how, how um, uh, the man up there that's in the Oval Office, who's, who they claim is smart, I'm talking about the same man that didn't even know there were 50 states in the, in the country, he's over there in Hawaii, uh, you know, uh, the, the 49th state that came into uh, the Union in 1959, which he got from um, the uh, Spanish and after the, uh, uh, the war in which we took it to the Spanish and showed them where it was at after this um, alleged firing on one of our ships <clears throat> out there. This was before the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in uh, 1898, and we went and, and made them pay for, well, we gave them $20 million, but <clears throat> we acquired uh, Guam, the Philippines, and Hawaii, and some other islands over there. We didn't make uh, Philippines uh, a state. You know, uh, we made them a state, but, you know, uh, if they keep messing up over there and have all these tsunamis, believe me, they'll be asking for statehood pretty soon. We'd be, we already give them all that money. <laughs> the, Philippines, the, Philippines, the, Philippines, the thing is, the Filipinos, at least they're grateful for what yeah, they get. They are, yeah. and, and they are, you know, um, friendly toward the United States and have committed no problems toward uh, the country. We've helped some other nations out, and we look what they've done to us, turning their back on anything that we've done and <clears throat> asking us to get out. But still send the money over there. No, I learned something. I didn't know Hawaii actually was part of the uh, thing that we got from Spain because yeah. I knew, I knew um, the Philippines of Guam was, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that Hawaii was. I knew that uh, Cook was on that island, those islands. And he got, I think he got killed by the Hawaiians in the late 1700s. You know, uh, Captain Cook. Yeah, but um, I didn't know that. The <coughs> yeah, our affiliation family. goes back to uh, 1898. I mean, our direct affiliation, which we began to you know show our guilt. We don't whenever we, whenever you know American people are really some of the greatest people on the planet. And they need to give themselves more credit. Uh, whenever they defeat somebody, they want to pay them some money as if we should not have won. <laughs> it's like it's an embarrassment of riches. It's like uh, noblesse oblige. Uh, noblesse oblige. Right, right. right. Noble's obligation. That, where, the, where the rich people are apologizing for their wealth. Right. It's like, well, it's like Nelson Rockefeller. Did you ever see the dead men who built America? Mm -hmm. uh, the Nelson Rockefeller, right. you know, the... Um, the guy who was the current, he's like actually a congressman or senator from West Virginia. He's talking about his, uh, you know, uh, his, um, you know, you know, his, uh, his predecessor, his grandfather, his great grandfather. Mm -hmm. And uh, this guy would have, I mean, this, the idea of public service would have been foreign to him if he didn't have all the money banked that his family's money, family's uh, activities mm -hmm. in, had netted. Mm -hmm. So, but he's not critical of his grandfather, his great grandfather's actions, you mm -hmm. know. And it's like, you know, but yeah, his, 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 Jay Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller, the guy who's the, uh, uh, he's, he, he got defeated in one state, went to another state, because and stayed stayed congressman. I mean, you know, that's basically he just didn't want to give up power. Mm -hmm. But he had, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. John, uh, you always make some excellent points. Um, <clears throat> the the so called robber barons, which is um, uh, there's a good book out, um, <clears throat> uh, written by um, by Fulton, who also wrote this book called. Um, about FDR, the um, the New Deal or Raw Deal, and you can believe he came down on the latter and not on the former. This idea of the New Deal being something that was, uh, in fact, positively consequential is uh, nonsense. And if you look at what the New Deal did, a lot of what we're facing right now <clears throat> goes back to this man who is on the list as the second or third, depending on which list you look at, the conservative list or the liberal list, as the second or third greatest president of the United States. you got to be kidding. Well, you, you've read the book, The, uh, the FDR Myth, then you by John Flynn. Uh, John book. Flynn was a journalist. Kurt, you know, he was a contemporary of that era. Yes, you know, he was. 
and uh, and he wasn't a, he wasn't a conservative. He wasn't a voice. He was actually considered more on the left. But he took the task. Um, FDR quite yes, a bit. Yes, he did. And he lost several jobs because of that. Yes, he did. And I'm I'm very much aware of uh, Flynn's uh, work <clears throat> in that book, uh, the folly uh, uh, um, uh, Jeff uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, and the folly of his administration. By the way, whenever they start to abbreviate the name of presidents, you can believe that that was one that was doing you in. Uh, what, are, what, what are the initials of Ronald Reagan? <laughs> John, <laughs> John, have you ever heard anybody call uh, Ronald Reagan RR? You know, FDR, JFK, LBJ. <laughs> I mean... What is this, uh, folks, that we're, we're dealing with here? You're being told. See, this idea, I, I remember when they asked somebody, uh, what's the name? Uh, who is uh, uh, um, uh, James Carter? Nobody could identify who that was. That's the name of the man's, that's, on, that's the name of the man's birth certificate. But they then uh, humanized the name and made it much more familiar as if you really got a, a cut buddy here. This is a cousin of yours, and his name is Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy, not James, Jimmy Carter. Nobody could recognize who it was because they didn't change James, which is a little more standoffish. It's like, you know, if you call a person Robert, okay, that's not so familiar. What about Bob? Bob is better. So, uh, you know, that's why they got that Bob in that commercial. So, Bob, if they call that guy that... Uh, that's, that's in that uh, commercial about if your age stops you from having uh, sex and all that, then look at Bob. Bob's a, Bob, Bob's a nerd. But he ain't Robert. So the question is, if Robert can take this medicine and he's all right, then you know he can take it. Look, this is Bob. This ain't Robert. <laughs> and this is kind of way they do you. They, they're brainwashing you when, when you're not even aware you're being brainwashed. But let's be honest here. Uh, and getting back to, um, you know, the real world, uh, we're talking about, you know, not the world in which we are presented, but the, but the real world. Uh, these people that have been put over us, <clears throat> that can't spell, you know, cat. One, we had a vice president that was telling a third grader that he spelled potato wrong. Don't forget that. Well, it was Dan Quayle. He was right next to becoming president. <clears throat> one heartbeat away from the president. And this guy couldn't spell under Bush uh, Senior couldn't spell. I'm not gonna make him president. Couldn't spell uh, potato until he told his third grader. The third grader standing on standing his ground. Now I hope y'all don't pass no laws against this. This third grader standing his ground. I hope that wasn't in Florida. <clears throat> but this guy was standing his ground, and. He was telling the vice president the word potato is spelled P-O-T-A-T-O. It's not an E on there. And there's Quail getting ready to slap this kid. <laughs> I mean, I dare you talk to the vice president that way. And this man thinks there's an E on the end of the word. Okay, well, the latest fiasco we got in, with our politicians now who are going to save us is the president is going to introduce... And talk about an aftermath of her singing a song. I only got a glimpse of this because <clears throat> I'm chilling through a lot of things. And here was the president up here talking about one of Aretha Franklin's famous hits. Now she's saying when she sang the song that was originally put out by Otis Redding, she actually in the song spelled the word correctly. So you would think if you put a, the song, the spelling to music, you can memorize the, the spelling. <laughs> because when you, if, listen, when you put something to music and you put a beat behind it, have you noticed this? Even Bob sitting in the back of the classroom like a nerd, even he can learn to spell if you sing it. So, so why couldn't the president do this? It just goes to show you, I think, that Obama has <laughs> not been your typical, you know, your, you know, your average black person growing up in Flint or Detroit or one of the industrialized cities in the north or even Chica you know, like Chicago. Mm -hmm. He's never been part of that. He's been always, okay, come on, he's lived abroad his entire life. 
He was cut off from American culture. Yes, he was. I'd say 90% of his adult existence. You know, and uh, to to actually, come on, I mean, I grew up singing that song, hearing that song in the bar radio. Yeah. That's how I learned how to spell respect. Yeah. I mean, so. yeah, right. Jared, they got a commercial that's out. It, it, they don't play it anymore because we finally caught on to that one and said, look here, you can't sell, it, sell that anymore. But it was one about Rolaids. And they were asking at the end of the commercial, how do you spell relief? Remember that one? Well, well folks, I, can you... <laughs> Can we agree on this one? Maybe we can not agree on other stuff we said here at FlintTalkRadio.com. But I think we can agree on this one. We can't agree on respect. <laughs> but the one we can not agree on is that you spell relief, R-E-L-I-E-F. You got that? But at the end of that commercial, they told us, and we were repeating it, that, that relief is spelled R-O-L-A-I-D-S. And I went in my classroom one day. Just to show you that, just to show them really what I already knew that they are that they are a group of of, of, of sheep. <laughs> and I went in my classroom and I asked them. I said, "Okay, Johnny, spell relief." And there it was. Oops, there it was. R O L A I D S. And I put my hand down on my chin like this in the classroom. And over my glass, in fact, I lowered my glasses like this right here to make sure he was sitting out there in the chair and his, my bifocals were not tuning in bozo. And I said, excuse me, you know, what? who's the English teacher? I mean, I'm a good speller. But when they tell me that relief is spelled Rolades, and Rolades is not even anywhere close, and here's the president spelling respect, and leaving the S out. And, and, and really, didn't if you notice it, John, did you notice? He didn't go back over the spelling. You know, if I misspell a word, but I know the spelling, because you know, we all make mistakes. We're all human. I mean, we got these genes. We're not perfect. Uh, we're not yet among the angels. Let's put it that way. But do you notice when the president misspelled the word and recognized in his fluttering around and uh, floundering around trying to, you know, see where the mistake was. He knew that that's not what Aretha said, but he couldn't remember what she said. But see, Aretha was, right. was on the teleprompter. You know, yeah, <laughs> and that's the other part of it. Uh, whenever this president speaks away from that teleprompter, get ready to put your pistol away. Ain't no note taken in that particular case because you be writing down nothing but nonsense. <laughs> and there he was trying to think about, that ain't what Aretha said, but what did she say? And he's left on, on record, R E. P C T. There were two letters left out of the word respect. Let me spell it for the president because I hope he does not say what he said because that's disrespectful of uh, not only Aretha Franklin but also that's respectful of Otis Redden. They disrespected two people at the same time. They both spelled it. And the man still hadn't gotten it. R E, I'm going to take this real slow, S P E C T. I'm talking to a third grader. Uh, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not. Talk, I'm talking to a politician, and because the third graders can spell this, and 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 I don't think the politicians can spell hardly anything. They certainly don't know anything. If I uh, judge it based upon uh, what I see them doing in Washington, also what I wrote about on my Facebook wall uh, today, because and that was just part one. Wait until I give you see part two. Well, it's like, you know, I think it's just bizarre, though, that so many people put trust in the government and these people who will wear suits and ties and go into Congress or to the Senate, you know, to the House or the Senate. And uh, they, these guys don't have them. I mean, they say they went to college. Well, if they're like Obama, how do they, how do they spend their time in college? Yeah, they sent their girlfriend to the classroom. And what do they study? I mean, it's like every, every the bulk of our lawyers, okay, that means you're just getting a very skewed view. You're not actually dealing with other considerations. You're just dealing with law. So, I mean... Law is a lot different than the reality that people have to face in the world. Yeah. And, they're, and, they're, and their expectations for this letter of the law scenario are just obscenely stupid. Yeah, and, and John, when they tell me they uh, have a degree from some university um, that's in the country today, I don't care which one it is, <clears throat> I don't want to really know when a person tells me they have a degree, I don't really want to know uh, in what field they have it. I want to know in what time period it was, in fact, issued. 
<clears throat> because I want people to understand something that has happened in terms of the competition between the universes when the word meant something and the day when it doesn't mean anything. You know, when it meant something, John, you probably noticed the competition was between the universities in terms of these competitive programs called College Bowl. Okay. <laughs> okay, you know what the, what, the, what the competition is now? The, 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 uh, the Cotton Bowl. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, it's like my ex-girlfriend, she put, chose a college because they didn't have a football team because she didn't want to go to a college that was known for its academic you know, uh, record rather than, you know, their score, or how many points they scored during a season. Uh, and, I mean, I agree with that. I mean, and other things, too, here's the thing. The liberals like to attack the religious right, but it was the religious organizations that give rise to all the name brand, organ, you know, Ivy League. They're, those universities all started by religious organizations' affiliations. Yes. Harvard, Yale, Princeton were all religious bent. And they had standards above these government-sponsored entities that are, embarrassingly call uh, universities and uh, colleges. Uh, and by the way, if you think they're universities, which means uh, universal, then John, look at the fact that Condoleezza Rice, <clears throat> I give the president of the university they are uh, at Rutgers uh, credit, but look at the fact that Condoleezza Rice, now she's only been the first um, black woman secretary of state I mean, you can't even give the job um, to uh, a, a white male after um, Condoleezza Rice had, I mean, after uh, Colin Powell had it. They put a black woman in there after that was over. She's the first black woman to become the Secretary of State. This is not, how, this is not big enough and uh, significant enough for the staff at Rutgers University over there in New Jersey. That's over there where that fat boy is. <laughs> and they just could not understand. I mean, what is this? They couldn't understand. They couldn't get it. You know, it wasn't quite sinking in of how anybody would invite Condoleezza Rice as a commencement speaker. This is even worse than Dr. Ben Carson being invited. He's on the the number one neurosurgeon in the world, what are they inviting him for? And so, I mean, this is a black person that's achieved something. This ain't, bring Jesse in here. So, or Cornell West. Or I mean, Cornell, that's still, that's still bring, a challenge. Bring the screamers in here. <laughs> but this man has accomplished something. What do you bring these black folks in here that really have some achievement? I dare you. And so they're going to bring Condoleezza Rice in there. And this staff went ballistics. I mean, the president has violated some chemical rule of the university to show some black folks who's actually done something. And so they didn't want Condoleezza Rice to come there and speak. Now, don't forget two things. One is the president stood up to the plate. Of course, he was hiding himself behind what a university is supposed to be, so he didn't want to take all the heat. So he was appealing to the sense of what the university is supposed to stand for. It wasn't just him. And look, that's what the university is for. That's where he was coming from. Where well, I would have told him to shut up. And if anybody says anything, we're going to go back into your contract and look and see if you got tenure. And if not, we're going to put you on some roller skates and roll, and roll you out of, and roll you out of here. But, you know, you don't do that because you get a suit. You get sued. We're in a very litigious time here. So you have to hide behind. Well, the university is supposed to be a place where we invite all ideas. But did they, but did they not embarrass themselves over the fact that the university is supposed to be entertaining a variety of views so the students can get a, a well-rounded education so they would be able to, within their own private thinking, come to some understanding of where they are on the issue, not somebody just throwing out there, you know, this um, way of, 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 of group thing, and everybody got to now fall into it, or you uh, uh, will not pass a class because they're grading you upon the ideas you put in your papers. Not whether or not you have a quality uh, point of view, but do you have a, a point of view consistent with the university uh, uh, point of view that's as, in fact, emoted, emitted, and uh, transmitted by those who's in front of those classrooms, if they're drawing on and on, expecting you to write down everything that they say, and they're going to test you on it, 
to make sure that you got the right understanding. But the president stood up to the plate, and I give him credit for that, no matter how many times he's trying to hide out that that was him making the decision. And I give him credit for standing up, and they're going to have Condoleezza Rice. I wonder if they're going to turn their back, you know, she's speaking and turn their back while she's talking or turn their, I'm going to be watching for the body language. I mean, they're going to turn to the side as if they ain't turning their back as uh, she speaks. But that tells you a lot about what it is that we are dealing with in terms of where these so-called universes stand. And let's face it right now, that they're not going to put any uh, quiz bowl up there where these Ivy League schools like Princeton and Cornell and Yale and Harvard and all these other universities, uh, Brown University is going to sit up there and put their student body on one side and put the other student body on one side and have them competing in terms of the intellectual content of where they are because they did that to embarrass themselves. You can't do it like you did in the past before the government completely went uh, into this um, liberal mode of everybody getting now speaking one voice, thinking one channel. And anyone who does not do that, in fact, you are not going to be uh, given uh, these fraudulent uh, uh, degrees. And so we, it, now what is the competition between universities? Well, <clears throat> look at the University of Alabama. Did that become a, a, a top one school uh, over and above uh, Harvard and Cornell and Princeton? No, they got the number one uh, football team two years in a row. And they weren't that bad this year when they didn't win it. Uh, they fall down to number three. Oh, I mean, that's like, you know, let's look at this, this, man, this man's contract. Because that's where the competition is right now. And I, I, I'm not casting no dispersions, but in uh, the University of Michigan, if he, if he don't get his act together, he's gone. <laughs> well, I, was, I, just, I just looked up a quote, you know, about uh, William F. Buckley, the famous conservative, you know, that he passed away a few years ago. He wrote that book that was famous about pointing out the, what the college is going awry about, about God and men at Yale back in the 1950s, 1960s. Anyway, he actually said that um, he actually thought the, uh, the college was denying its, uh, sense of any sense of individuals by making them embrace the ideas of liberalism. <laughs> and so basically, he, said, he foresaw this, and he was getting, it's gotten worse, far worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, I worked at the university, and you did, you do too. I did. And if you, uh, you, unless you got a real sense of intestinal fortitude and mm -hmm. gutsy, you can better not voice anything that differs from the uh, dogma there, because they're willing to... Man, they they only try to uh, break apart your arguments. They just do a personal attack. That's right. And I've seen that so many times. They won't even when you ask about the welfare state, the liberal. I had that because I was a professor. Mm -hmm. I was you know a, st a staff member of there. I was considered to be on par with them. Although I probably has read as much I and mean, been part of that as much as any of those other people have. No so. question about that. Yeah. You read more. Uh, you know, I, I'll tell you something. You see, I went to college. And it was a fairly conservative uh, college, but I went to college not knowing uh, what to expect because I was the first one in my neighborhood that actually uh, that I know about. Certainly in my in my collegial um, relationships, I mean those who were the same age that I was, I, I was the first one in that group to uh, to go to college. So nobody came back to the neighborhood and said, "Look, when you go to college, this is what you need to you need to expect once you get there." I mean, I didn't know. So when I went there, I'm thinking, okay, this is um, the college level, it's above the high school level, and therefore we are entertaining all ideas. And I remember uh, getting thrown out of my sociology class. I won't call the person's name out, although he's deceased right now, but a lot of people still know who he is. Uh, he was uh, sitting up there in front of the class. He never did stand up because of his weight. And uh, he always sat down and gave us... Um, uh, a full understanding of the universe from his chair. But one day he came in the classroom and gave the test, and he was up there in front of the room bragging about how hard the test was. I mean, he was so smart, nobody could pass his exams. And he was saying, ladies and gentlemen, I remember his words this all these years later, ladies and gentlemen, you can't pass this test because I can't pass this test myself without my notes. Well, you know what? When I was in elementary school and, and high school, we had memorized a lot of things. So I'm sitting there in that chair. I, don't, I think I was sitting like in the uh, third seat or so, somewhere around there. I'm shaking my head 
inside. I'm not shaking my head outward, but I'm shaking my head inward. I'm saying to myself, I don't care what's on that test. <laughs> I'm saying to myself, I'm passing that test. I don't care what's on it. Because I had pr pretty much memorized, you know, what was in those chapters. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't mean word for word, but I pretty much knew what was in those chapters. It was tested on three chapters. And I had even read the footnotes where he took some of his questions from the footnotes. He wasn't uh, fooling me. I, read, I, I knew how he tested Try, because he was trying to act like he was smart. And that meant he had to fail everybody because he had an ego problem and thought that in order to, if he failed everybody, and that shows how superior he is as if you can't fail anybody upon what you know. <clears throat> and so I had read everything and read the footnotes, looked at the bibliography. So when he passed that test out, he couldn't, he couldn't stop talking about how difficult it was. I'm, while he's talking about that, writing the answers out, going through it, about 15 minutes into the test, John, I, I passed my test in and walked out. Because, you know, in college, you can walk out of your classroom. You don't, you know, you're not walking out. I, was, I wasn't walking out, quite frankly, to, to show him up. I was walking out because I wasn't ready for the next test, which is going to be in two hours. I was going home early to go and study for the next test in my dorm room because I had not studied that for that one. I was going to get the first one out of the way and then worry about the second one once the first one was, was finished. But he didn't know that. All he saw was... <laughs> He's up there bragging about how hard the test was. And here this Johnny come lately, sophomore, walking out on him like, who is this guy? And the, and the kids told me, the other students told me during lunch hour, said, uh, George, uh, doctor, his name started with a C, but I'm not going to call his name out on the air. I don't want, because I, I think he's, just, he's deceased now, but I don't want to call his name on the, on the air because I don't even want to have his name cross my lips. Cross my lips. L I P S, lips. I didn't say lisp, my lips. And so I'm not going to call his name out. And so I was, I, so the kids, the students came to me and said, George, this is doing lunch hour. So I'm in the cafeteria. George, he wanted to know who you were. Wanted to know how many times have you had his class. And blah, blah, blah. He was really mad. I said, why was he mad? He said, because, he, and he asked, who are you? Who is that young man? So, the next class period, he walks in. This is Saturday, about 10 o'clock in the morning. The class met at 10. I came in. I was sitting in my seat, as I always do, about five minutes before he arrived because I didn't want them to have that against me. I was always in my chair to eliminate that as a reason why you're throwing me out. And so he walked in, didn't even get his foot across the threshold, and then pointed to me in that chair where I was sitting in the third uh, seat. I think in the third row or so, I think I could be wrong about that, but I know it's in the third seat because I wouldn't sit in the back, but I wouldn't sit in the exact front either uh, because I didn't want to spit on me. And so so <laughs> he walked across the threshold and pointed at my chair and said, it was raining that day, and said, you can get out of here and threw me out. I left too. I mean, he told me to get out. I got my, my coat. My umbrella, collected my books, and I got out. That's what I did. I don't mind telling you, I left. Let me tell you what else I did. I came back. And I showed him this. That I'll make A's on your test, but I know how to sit in my seat. You know why I did that? Because I knew what has now been proven, and that was that after I finished this university, I would never see him again. And I was not going to let him put his foot anywhere except across that threshold, and I was not going to let him put his foot in my way. All right, and I didn't. You see, I knew how to get out. I get a little, little emotion. I get, I know how to, I knew how to get out because
done, I'm gonna let, let it go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's I mean that's like you're. I've had like I've I've had very strong experiences too in in the academic setting where they attack personally, and um, and you're an educator too. You know, you're an educator too. You became a teacher in the school system for forty almost close to forty years. Uh huh. But um, I had a lot of attack. I was personally attacked several times in college as well as in um. Well, not so much in college, actually, but junior high, high school, and elementary school. And uh, it had me, I definitely had a certain animus, create a certain animus against um, so called educators. So, I mean, I can understand. I mean, that was 40, uh, 30 some, 30, 40 years ago for me. And I can understand, you know, being emotional about these confrontations, these, these confrontations and these challenges to your in intelligence <coughs> and your integrity. I can understand it having yeah, emotional. Yeah, I'll tell you why impact. I get emotional is because, in this case here, is because I was taught to stand down by Elaine Foster Moss. That's why I get emotional. I have been taught to stand down. That's something that people have not taught their children. You see, I stood down because I couldn't win. But I could win if I came back and I got thrown out of that class. But but it does not mean I got thrown out again, out of it, out of that class again because I understood what I needed to do not to get thrown out. Once I saw he was offended by me standing up out of my seat, which is a violation, and then walking out of the room to go study for another test. In fact, i tell you what happened uh, there. To be honest, when, when I finish this test in the future, I'm just telling you this for your own um, you know, benefit since it's not taught too much. There are not very many laying false and monsters around anymore. But what I, uh, what I did when I finished this test in the future is that I taught him something without me having to have a conversation with him. Because when I finished my test, John, bring me some tissue when you get a chance. I, I, because I, what I did was to, um, when I finished this test, I would take my pen, get another piece of paper out, and began to doodle. Thank you, John. Because I, I really need that tissue. <laughs> this is my emotional day. <laughs> and I'm going to use part of it because uh, I may need another part. I don't think I'm going to need it uh, beyond this point. But there, are, these are some emotional uh, experiences. Excuse me. And, uh, and when you recall them, you don't really realize how much of the emotion is embedded until you begin to recall what that trauma was like. It was painful to be uh, thrown out of a classroom and knowing that you had not really done anything other than the things you should have done in order to further your own career. And to be punished for that, uh, it, it you know, was very painful. But I got out of his room because Elaine Foster Moss had taught me to, um, to stand down. But I'll tell you what I did though in the following test Whenever he gave a test in the future, I was designed, I was determined to teach him something. I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't want to go to his office. I didn't want to have a conversation with him. I need his class in order to graduate. And so what I did in the future was I was going to teach him a lesson. That was when, I, when he gave the next test, I taught him two things. Because after I finished the test, I sat there at the, at the uh, at my desk doodling. I took out a sheet of paper and I was just simply, you know, I'm not, I can't, I can't draw. But I was just drawing circles and putting a couple of eyes in it and putting a smile on there and things like that. Just doodling to myself. And he saw that I was idle and uh, not doing anything. Well, look at the test, put the test to the side. And he saw that. And he came and looked over, he was walking around the room, but I knew he was trying to get around to where my chair was. Because he wanted to look kind of from the back and then look over my shoulder. He thought maybe I had some notes out or something. He made around to my, my seat and looked over my shoulder. And he saw that I was doodling. And then he looked over there where my test was and looked at you know what I had written down as my answers. And what I, what I taught him was two things. I taught him that I can stay in my seat. And I taught him that I was not a smart like I'm a smart student. And there was absolutely nothing he could do about it. I guess that was the third thing I taught him. Because I was not going to let him stop me. And he didn't stop me. 
And any emotion I have over that is because the emotion comes from the fact that I was fighting him every step of the way and he never even saw it. You're not fighting when you start getting in people's face and start moving your head <clears throat> or out here doing this stupid savagery called the knockout game. That ain't no game. People are hurting people. <clears throat> You're nothing but a thug. And I could have gone thug on the instructor by getting up there and moving my head and I would have lost and would have lost everything. But I was not going to do that and waste my time. What, what kind of recourse would your that fat facility, you know, that college gave you, though? I mean, students, I mean, years ago, basically, the professors ruled. I mean, it's like a, now that since the 70s, they had more challenges allowed to mm -hmm. their authority. But, um, yeah, that back then, another thing was, too, if, if you was a white instructor and you were going to, a, you know, a, you know you're, let's face it, you're going to college and a lot of blacks didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that could have been even, that probably been intensified more because you didn't realize, you, you realize you didn't really have recourse. Didn't have Le recourse other than the recourse that I took. I had an out, I, there's, always, there's always a way out. And you have to always figure out in what given situation you're in to figure out which way is out of it because it's never going to be total enclosure. Some of the enclosure comes as a response to the response to the original enclosure. And if you can't figure out how not to put the the, 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 the foul uh, gate up around the enclosure. You know, there's a gate out of the enclosure. There's also a, a gate that blocks you from getting out of it. And I had to figure out which one of the two was a, was a gate that opened the door out of the enclosure, and that was a gate that, that I had to, had to choose. I, I've done that in many different cases where the situation could have pretended a situation in which I, I lost, but I try not to choose that because we're born to win and you can only choose to lose because life is not, you're not born to lose, you're born to win <clears throat> but you have to figure out how to do that it, I mean, you <laughs> just because you're born to win, I mean, they're going to hand you, hand you a victory <laughs> and, see, the, the, see, and the thing is, I've got to say some liberals, their, their motivation is decent, it's honorable to a certain degree mm -hmm. they want to guarantee a better outcome for people <laughs> but yeah. let's face it unless somebody's willing to step forward and put the effort to try to make an attempt for something Handing them a victory is like stepping all over those people who actually are willing to put forth the effort. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, John, you and I have these these talks uh, both off air and, and on the air, and you you're a thinker, and and that's what sets you apart from a lot of the people I come in contact with. Which is one of the I have to get through before, before I get off the air because that, that's one thing I came to talk about in particular, and that is a post that I did on this buffoon called uh, by the name of Al Sharpton. And uh, and I will tell you about that before I get off there. How much time do we have, John? We're at for uh, forty-eight minutes right now. Okay. So coming up on forty-eight. And I will I will definitely talk about that before we get off the air because that's that's really the main point that I wanted to uh, to make because of something that happened in uh, in one of my posts and something that happens always on my posts because you'd be surprised of of, of how much and how many people come on my wall basically disagree with me, to disagree with me. Who um, read my post, quite frankly, because they think that they're going to, at some point, um, bully me into uh, stop writing because they, um, they, don't, they, quite frankly, do not intend to answer any of the things that I say. They're going to, I'm, I'm kind of like, um, I'm not on the same level as Thomas Sowell. I don't claim anywhere near being on that uh, level. But it's like the problem that he has, and that is uh, that. When he writes a book, none of the scholars who call them, none of the person who call themselves uh, scholars in the academic world actually respond to Thomas Sowell. What they do is simply uh, treat his work with silence as if he didn't write anything. And by simply not responding to it is a way of dismissing it and a way of saying without actually saying, because if you say it, then you got a problem because he can defend himself. But by, dis by not saying it while dismissing it, you don't allow him to come back with any of his own missiles to defend his proposition. So it's a way of getting around having to confront the arguments he makes by simply not recognizing the arguments. You understand what I'm saying here? So in my case, though, I get something different because they know I'm not Thomas Sewell. So what I get is all the fatheads, all... <laughs> 
I have to say this, and I know it's not going to sound well over the air. All the idiots, are, all of the people who I put in my post that are too stupid for words, who come, come on my wall with no information, but they have, they're going to stand me down because guess what? The proof of the illegitimacy of my arguments is that they disagree with the arguments. That's it. And when I wrote about this buffoon, Al Sharpton, and he is a buffoon. And I can't say that enough times because this man is, is really totally ignorant. I can't help it. We got a, somebody, somebody equally as crazy as he is gave him a television show. We can spread his ignorance all over the airways, but isn't that the point of television? I mean, the same TV set that projected that projects the image of Al Sharpton also projects the image of Bozo the Clown. And if it's not, if it's a uh, <laughs> and if it's a serious instrument of information, even on his serious programs, then how do you explain Chris Matthews? No, I got. Let me let me let me rewind that because that is not in total. How do you explain? I know you got an explanation out there. How do you explain the whole network of MS LSD? I mean NBC. <laughs> How do you explain this, folks? Somebody help me with this one. I need some help. No, no, not in the stuff you try to help me with. I need some help and somebody trying to explain to me why the FCC they wants to be in all the boardrooms to watch what you in fact printing. <laughs> Who want to be in all the boardrooms to make sure that you're putting forth information. Explain to me, George W. Moss. I'm not Al Gonkin J. Calhoun. But explain to me, George W. Moss, how it is, please, that the FCC has not grabbed MS, LSD, I mean NBC's license. If you want to go in the boardroom, and you don't go in that boardroom, can I ask you a question? What is your point outside of suppression? Because that's the boardroom you should go in first, because I don't see nothing going on over there that does anything other than you in there editing the tapes of George Zimmerman and making him appear to be a racist when the man was helping out black folks in Florida, teaching black children. I mean, this man must be totally disgusted with, uh, with black people. This man was, in fact, the one that intervened on the part of police officers that had abused a homeless black man when blacks didn't even speak out against it. And the media turned this man into a racist. And a white guy. <laughs> and turned him into a white guy. Yeah. I mean, it's like, and nobody, and nobody, another thing is too, L, L. Sharpton should not have a career anywhere in the media. Tell me 1987, about 1987, he tried to, if, if people weren't more level-headed like they were, there would have been a race fight on um, um, unprecedented levels in that area because of the, the, the you know, the, uh, the broad side he did. It was totally baseless about a racist attack on that Tom Bradley. Everybody's hands got sorted in that affair. And he, but he still has credibility at all? Because of the paymasters whose hands are sorted. You saw what they did. So there's no doubt about why they would support a buffoon of this magnitude. Look at what they did. In other words, what do we expect of people that would hire a person like this and what do we expect of them when they did the things that they did which is in the same genre of what this man uh, does and what this man represents I'm not surprised they hired him I would be surprised if they hired anybody that had the character <clears throat> look at that network and what that network is doing that's why and people are finally waking up to that that's why they are tuning their station away from it and the FC and they want to put the FCC in these other rooms where the people are, have gone to because they're not any longer listening to uh, people like Chris Matthews and they ran this other bozo on CNN out of the country who said that he would leave if they didn't pass something that would in fact suborn the Second Amendment where we don't have the right to uh, bear arms although it's there in black and white in absolute terms and they want to take that from the people and talk about you got to be licensed 
to um, bear uh, arms and didn't want to make it like uh, you only were given the right to bear arms in the first place because uh, it's about going, going and shooting some deers in the forest. I mean, this is the kind of thing that, that, they, are, that they are putting out out there. And I, you know, I would rather, um, you know, I have to tell you something. I just rather, you know, uh, uh, be in, be incarcerated uh, uh, physically than somebody to incarcerate my my thought process and make me begin to speak to things that I don't believe in and I, that I can't say. What kind of society would that be if if we gain in to those kinds of people who who want to make it appear they can think within our own heads? and tell us what views we ought to have in a society that claims it is in fact free. That's all liberals are notorious for trying to tell me every time, you shouldn't feel that way, you shouldn't think that way. <laughs> well, why? All because I don't agree with it, I find you, and then they go on the list of litany of name calling, they're not making a case against what I'm stating, <laughs> they're not making a case at all intellectually, they're just calling names. Yeah, and I know that, look, John, that's out of having no arguments. Uh, I, I, this, let me finish up with this guy because we're running out of time here. Uh, this, this, this one, this one guy said to me, uh, George, you know, he wants to use my first name. At least they can say Moss. I mean, don't be talking about, that's like you calling, if my name was Robert and you called me Bob. Use my last name. You don't know me that well. People I don't even know. George, you begin to sound like, and John, John they admitted this as insult. George, you begin to sound like Clarence Thomas. They were surprised when I not only... Uh, wasn't insulted by the comment, but I embraced it and said that you think with your stupid self that you insulted me by calling me Clarence Thomas. Now, you would have insulted me if you called me, I'm sounding more like Jesse Jackson, a man who's injured the black community, injured the country, and injured everybody that this man purports to be leading. Nobody's being helped by this man. And every black community is, in fact, in trouble because they've been listening to people like this man and Al Sharpton. Not because of Clarence Thomas, which you made up things about in terms of um, Clarence Thomas. I am telling you that your narrative about this person has no credence. You don't have any evidence. I brought this book here. I didn't get a chance to talk about it. I brought this book here that you have not read because you don't read anything. That's why we get this study group. I see Catherine's in the studio. She and me in here hollering. I'm going to continue to holler at you. <laughs> Not at Catherine. <laughs> I'm going to continue to holler at you boneheads. I, I, was at this, I was at this one group. This one guy, I was talking to him. He said, I'm trying to discuss things with you. And you holler, he said, and we, we said we just, we just talking. I said, no, that's what you're doing. What I'm doing is hollering. I'm not talking. I'm hollering at you. Because... If you come here telling me some stuff that you're telling me, I'm a young, like we can't have no conversation when the conversation is down here on this level. We, we can't talk down here on this level. I'm not talking to you. I'm hollering at you. And you got to understand that. I raise my voice at you because you're trying to tell me this nonsense and think you're going to get into my space saying that that ain't going to happen. I'm sorry. It ain't going to happen. And, the, and you're having a conversation. You know why? Because what you're doing is talking upwards, and I'm talking downwards, and how am I going to be in a conversation with you? You're in a conversation. I'm in a hollering match. <laughs> That's just the way it is. I know John telling me to get out of here. Well, how much time have you got, John? Because I know you're going to tell me to get on out of here. And, uh, and I have to tell you something, that almost all of what I'm dealing with on Facebook not all of it, most of it is, you know, uh, nonsense. That's why I post every day. And I post one long article a day. If I get my adrenaline up because some other stuff happens I didn't intend and some other things come up in the news, then I have to post more than once. But I, I intend to have one major post. Today's post was about three and a half pages. And uh, I have to tell you that that, uh, that was a long post. And it's only part one because I had to, when I got through with it, I said, I'm not even finished with the topic yet. I'm just getting into it. So I had to do a part two tomorrow. But I was talking about these politicians. That, that requires more than one part. Because, I'm a, I'm, because I, I fully intend to call them out. And I, I fully intend to do what I can. I can't do a lot. But I fully intend to wake up as many people as I can about who these politicians are. Because if you think that they're going to solve some of the problems of this country, well, homeboy is here to tell you it ain't happening. 
And so I got to do a two-parter on that one and, and some two-parts on some others come up in the, in the future. But let's face it here. We, we got a lot of work to do and very little of this being done. And uh, hopefully tomorrow, uh, hopefully tomorrow in part two, if we get enough time, I'll deal with this Republican Party because a lot of people think that I'm a Republican. And I, I, I would not ab abuse myself of being a part of either one of these two corrupt uh, parties. I'm a conservative. I'm not a, a black Republican. I wouldn't embarrass myself that way. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, Douglas was, was, a, was a black conservative. But that's because Douglas was appreciative of the fact that they had um, the Republican Party had freed the slaves. Well, you know what? After they freed the slaves... I then freed myself. So I can't give that to no party and claim a party did that. Douglas can claim it. And those of you that are going around here with these, these Douglas shirts talking about you Republicans, you confuse, uh, you know, too. Douglas wasn't confused. You're confused. Talking about you, a, a black Republican on the, on the base of, of Frederick Douglas. Okay, I got to close down, John. <laughs> okay, got to get out of here, folks. John and Toby. Here's John. If I don't want John to saw his neck off, I got to get out of here because John's back there doing this right here. And I think he's going to saw his neck off. Okay, folks, that's it for today. I'll see all of you next week. Until that time, I want you to follow your dream. If you don't follow your dream, you'll never know what's on the other side of the rainbow.